In this video, I'll continue my series on the Brahms symphonies by discussing his greatest, most ingeniously constructed symphonic scherzo, the spectacular third movement of his fourth symphony, that ends with one of my favorite exciting coda sections. In contrast to this symphony's apocalyptic, tragic outer movements, and its sublime but often troubled second movement, this scherzo is, for the most part, boisterous and lively throughout, beginning in C major with a fortissimo opening that actually consists of three separate themes occurring one after the other in quick succession. Each of these in turn consists of two important components, so I'll give each theme two closely related colors. Remember from prior videos that C major was an important sonority in both of the first two movements, though never acting as the unambiguous tonic until now. Notice how amazingly disjointed this opening is, jumping from one idea to the next almost like a stream of consciousness, even though all three themes do share the same triumphant fanfare-like character. Like we've already seen in this symphony's first two movements, Brahms begins this one with immediate contrapuntal complexity, combining the opening purple theme with its inversion, though in this case not a completely strict reflection of the intervals. This first idea concludes with this dramatic interrupting pink chord that produces the effect of momentarily freezing or halting the music whenever it appears throughout this movement. The orange second theme immediately enters with its distinctive staccato rhythm. Da -da 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 -da. But notice that I'm also highlighting its simplified version in the woodwinds, and that these arpeggiated figures get their own mustard color. If the pink chord wasn't already dramatic enough, the blue theme now bursts onto the scene in the distant key of E-flat major without any modulation, accompanied by these light blue arpeggios, and returning to C major by the end of this second page. Also, before we move on, remember that the scoring for the first two movements was identical, but now Brahms expands the woodwind section to include a piccolo and a contrabassoon, and expands the percussion section to include three timpani, and most importantly, now a triangle. This is his only symphonic movement scored for triangle, though he had called for the instrument in two previous major orchestral works, the Haydn Variations and the Academic Festival Overture and in some smaller pieces, like his own orchestration of his Hungarian dances. Also, be careful if you Google Brahms and Triangle to fact-check what I just said. Moving on, after returning to C major, Brahms repeats the orange theme, but now piano, and just as the simplified version, without the distinctive staccato rhythm, though he does introduce this new dotted variant that I'm just going to give the same orange color. This time he expands the mustard-colored portion and combines it with imitative fragments of the first three notes of the purple theme and its inversion, and with the original distinctive rhythm of the orange theme played by the horns and trumpets. Notice that these purple fragments even have the same articulation as the opening theme. This builds to a reprise of the fortissimo opening purple theme, but now the counterpoint is inverted so the inverted or upside-down version is now in the higher register, while the upright version is now in the bass. Like before, this is interrupted by the pink chord, but now this chord includes the first appearance of the triangle, and helps to modulate to the repeat of the orange theme, this time in the dominant key of G major. Now listen up to this point from the beginning of the movement.
strings now play entries of the orange rhythm that hint at the falling thirds from the first movement, before the woodwinds do more than just hint, playing this entire long chain that I already mentioned in my video on the first movement. These are also the two slightly different blue colors I used in that video, so this has nothing to do with the blue theme from this movement. This introduces a new carefree green theme answered by this rising figure in the woodwinds, and then by its inversion. This movement is in sonata form, so I'd normally call this the contrasting theme in the expected dominant key of G major. But in this case, although we definitely modulated to G major on the prior page, I always hear this new theme as though it's still in C major, likely because it begins with what sounds like a 5-1 cadence, and has a conspicuous F natural in this bar. This whole section until the end of the exposition sounds to me almost like a harmonic no man's land between C major and G major, but feel free to comment if you experience it differently. Remember that Brahms's music in general, but especially this symphony, is famous for its relentless thematic variation and development, and we now hear another great example of this as the green theme repeats, but like the orange theme earlier, now as a simplified skeleton of its former self, transforming its already carefree character, with of course the help of the triangle, into one of Brahms's most whimsical moments. Notice also the variation of the answering rising figure, now in triplets, followed again by its inversion. As I've mentioned in prior videos, Brahms loves this simplified skeleton variational technique, and one of my favorite other examples is in the finale of his third symphony, that begins with this theme, and shortly thereafter Brahms uses its simplified skeleton for this loud outburst, answered by its original, more complicated second half. The simplified version then becomes the primary material for the following modulatory section. Back to the fourth symphony, the exposition section ends and transitions to the development section with slightly varied and then rhythmically augmented entries of the simplified skeleton. This development section, like the one we discussed from the first movement, begins by repeating the opening theme as if the exposition section were being repeated, but quickly deviates from what happened before by expanding the surprising pink chord into a call and answer between two groups of orchestral forces one including the timpani and the other including the triangle. The orange theme tries to ignore this deviation by entering like before in C major, but is rudely interrupted by two additional pink chords that seem to be reminding the orange theme that we're in the development section now, since it immediately enters again, but now in the relative A minor and combined with entries of the original purple motif. This has always been one of my favorite passages from this scherzo partly because of the tricky phrasing. Thus far, the purple theme has only occurred on a very emphatic downbeat, as the obvious beginning of a phrase, but now it enters, yes, technically still on a downbeat, but on a confusingly weak-sounding downbeat after this irregular five-bar phrase caused by this extra pink chord. It also likely sounds confusing because we are used to this four-beat pattern that now thwarts our expectations a beat early. Now listen to this beginning of the development section.
The development continues first with the simplified orange theme, but then with contrapuntal combinations of the dotted version, the mustard-colored motif, and this syncopated downward scale that I'll highlight purple since it resembles the downward scale from the opening theme. We've now arrived at the distant key of C-sharp minor, a half step above where we started at the beginning of the movement. And we just heard from the woodwinds the first instance of the inverted purple theme being played all alone. The strings immediately answer with the upright version, and this unharmonized fortissimo outburst begins an extended diminuendo consisting of fragments of the purple, orange, and mustard motifs that eventually reaches triple piano and ends with this tongue-in-cheek C-sharp minor offbeat pizzicato chord that I'm highlighting pink because it's just the delayed answer to the preceding purple theme. I already mentioned this next portion of the development section in my video on the first movement when I discussed Brahms' other favorite method of variation, altering the rhythm of a theme by selectively lengthening or shortening certain notes. When you listen to it this time, notice that we're now in the even more distant key of D-flat major after an enharmonic respelling of the tonic, and that this more subdued statement of the theme begins with a single note from the triangle and is answered again by a pizzicato pink chord from the strings, before this bassoon solo leads us to the next section. This single triangle note at letter F reminds me of Wagner's similar orchestration in his Meistersinger prelude that signals the famous moment when all three themes are played simultaneously. Please watch my video from a few years ago to learn more about this prelude. Back to Brahms, the development section now ends with an even more relaxed passage that consists of the most polar thematic transformation yet. Notice that the explosively energetic blue figure from the opening theme has been conspicuously absent from this entire movement since it first occurred but now it finally returns as this barely recognizable tranquil pastoral horn theme, but now with a slightly altered rhythm and legato. Additionally, notice that the original light blue accompanimental arpeggios have also been transformed into pizzicato eighth notes in place of legato sextuplets. Over the years, I've seen numerous publications and program notes refer to this short section we just heard as the trio of this scherzo. 
Formally, this doesn't make much sense to me in a large sonatiform movement like this, but I will admit that it's somewhat trio-like, since trios are often more rustic and relaxed than the more energetic scherzos or minuets. But this brings up an even more important question, given the title I chose for this video. Is this movement actually a scherzo, and do any of Brahms's other symphonic third movements qualify as scherzos? I'm amazed by the completely contradictory answers that exist in the literature. Some claim that this is Brahms's only true symphonic scherzo, since the others have tempo markings that are too slow, while others claim that this is the only one that doesn't qualify, since it's in sonata form and the others have the more typical ternary form, though that's not exactly true for Symphony No. 2, as we'll see in a future video. I personally tend to think of the third movements of symphonies 1, 2, and 4 as at least very scherzo-esque, while that of the third symphony has always seemed more like a slow movement to me, because of the gravity of its character, even despite its ternary form. So with that out of the way, I stand by the title I gave this video. And while I'm talking about Brahms's other symphonies, notice how the original triplet version of this blue theme sounds very similar to this theme from his third symphony, shown here as it appears in the finale, though it's first introduced in the second movement. Also notice how the new transformed version of the blue theme is reminiscent of this theme from the finale of his second symphony. Back to the fourth symphony, we just heard this new trio-like transformation of the blue theme modulate from D-flat major all the way back to this G dominant seventh chord. Anyone accustomed to listening to sonata form movements is at this point likely expecting a dramatic return of the opening purple theme in C major to begin the recapitulation section. But instead, Brahms completely skips over the purple and orange themes directly to the original explosive version of the blue theme in its original wrong key of E flat major. Now listen to this surprising and startling moment. With some audio editing, we can hear how this moment might have sounded if Brahms had chosen to begin this recapitulation section in the standard, expected way. Of course, I prefer this moment as he actually composed it, since it allows the section to begin so jarringly in the wrong key while simultaneously being in the right key to allow everything to continue mostly as it did in the exposition section. But listen for this new one-time-only syncopated variant of the orange theme that I'll highlight yellow.
We just heard the return of the green theme, but since we're in the recapitulation section, now in the tonic key of C major, though it still has that same confusing duality that now makes it sound like it's an F major. Now, instead of repeating as the humorous simplified skeleton like before, we hear the most contrasting transformation yet, when it repeats, but this time dressed up in the triplet rhythms and explosive festive character of the blue theme. This dynamic new hybrid variant brings us finally to one of Brahms's most exciting coda sections that somehow maintains a feverishly high energy level throughout its 76 bars. For reference, that's more than a fifth of the entire movement's length. Elisabeth von Herzogenberg, whom we encountered in my last Brahms video, also wrote to Brahms about this movement, stating that this coda seemed as if you had written it quite breathlessly or in one long-drawn breath. I think this is a wonderfully fitting description, since by the end it really does have the urgency of someone about to collapse from lack of oxygen. It begins somewhat mysteriously, with a long dominant pedal point played as the orange rhythm by the timpani, and as offbeat pizzicato notes by the contrabasses, over which the strings play the imitative fragments of the purple motif in its inversion, but now peppered with fragments of the mustard-colored motif. This is interrupted twice by strettos or imitative overlapping entries of the purple motif, leading to this rhythmically augmented entry that sets in motion the final crescendo. <laughs> just heard an F major entry of the purple theme, followed by another call-and-answer expansion of the pink chord. If you detest ledger lines as much as I do, you might not have noticed that these enormous leaps are just camouflaging a simple upward scale. A, B, C, D, E flat. <laughs> and that this is just a transposed anticipation of the opening five notes of the finale. Remember from my videos on the first symphony, the similar pre-announcement of the opening notes of the finale in that symphony's third movement. Returning to the fourth symphony, this frantic coda continues with entries of the orange theme, now in B flat major, but modulating down a half step on the next page to A major. Tonally, this coda seems to be spinning out of control, 
but it all makes sense on the very next page when the explosive blue theme makes one final triumphant appearance, now for the first time in the tonic key of C major. In other words, the modulation to A major was necessary so he could use the same surprising sudden key change we heard on the first page when C major suddenly became E flat major to now return to C major from A major. It's the same chromatic mediant relationship, in both cases jumping up a minor third to the flat mediant key. Now listen to this amazing moment. Before I conclude this video by playing this entire coda section without interruption, notice that this is also the first and only time the blue theme is combined with the orange and mustard colored figures. Also, remember that at the beginning of the movement, the surprising E flat major entry of the blue theme quickly reverted to C major, but now in the coda, Brahms obviously does not do the analogous reversion to A major, but instead alters the remainder of the blue theme to remain in C major, so he can end the movement with one final C major entry of the opening purple theme and pink chord. Now listen without interruption to the entire breathless coda of Brahms's greatest symphonic scherzo. <laughs> 